scripture that's uh, rather remarkable. It's one of those that actually encourages me to trust the Bible because if I had been editing the Bible, I would have cut this story out. <laughs> so listen now to the word of God as it comes to us from Mark's Gospel, the seventh chapter. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about it, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now this woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. See why I would have left this story out? I mean, you know, the, the promise in the Old Testament, you know, the, the Jews are the promised, you know, the children of the promise. They inherit the promised land. They are the chosen people. And it's very clear in this story that this woman, she's, list, she's named as a Gentile. Later, she's Syrophoenician. Whatever that is, we'll talk about that later, but it's certainly not of Israel. And what does Jesus say to her when she asks for her daughter, for her daughter's sake? It's not right that, that you should get the food meant for the children. No, no, only the dogs, dogs get to eat that later. No, oh my. Try to read the original languages and you hope that dogs is like a little bit nicer than it sounds in English, but it's not. It's not. So did Jesus really say this? Did this really happen this way? Because the most amazing thing that happens, really, is that Jesus changes his mind. I mean, this woman says to him, well, she, even the dogs get the crumbs off the table in the household. And Jesus says, well, you're right. And because you've said this, your daughter as well. Does Jesus really change? Does he really change his mind? I remember doing a Bible study on this once with somebody who said, this is really, this can't be. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's not going to change his mind. And there are all kinds of ways you can try to pretty up the scripture and make it work better with varying degrees of success. Myself, I don't mind my theology a little ragged and uneven. So I'm just willing to take this story at face value and say that Jesus, Jesus changed his mind. And maybe it's better to say that Jesus changed his heart because this woman opened his eyes to, to a truth, perhaps, and surely that Jesus knew, but maybe he was tired, maybe he was, who knows. But he certainly, he certainly wasn't in touch with that truth at that moment. I like to think that, actually, that Jesus changing his mind, changing his heart, is a message that sometimes we're called to do the same. The 2016 campaign, I would like to say it's just begun, but it began months ago. And you know, one of the things you cannot do as a presidential candidate is change your mind. That is like the kiss of death. And right now, all these candidates are pulling out old video files of other candidates saying things that they no longer say to prove that they have changed their mind, hence they're not qualified for high office. But don't we want people to use their experience, to use their knowledge, to use their encounters with other people, with other ex experiences? Don't we want them to be able to change their minds? Surely we do. Surely we do. 
The sad thing, of course, is we get the politics we want, usually. I mean, none of us like the ne negative campaigning stuff, but the sad thing is we respond to it. Uh, we don't like this, this, this changing of mind thing. You ought to be able to change your mind, but when they do it, we make them pay for it. So we sort of get the politics that we want, I'm afraid. Even the whole idea of politics as entertainment <coughs> sort of has become. Yeah. The sad thing is we respond to it. So we sort of get the politics we ask for in a way. But really, don't we want leaders who are capable of really weighing the issues, continually weighing them, <coughs> and being willing to at least to consider a different path, a different course, even a different conviction that's different from their own? I mean, how often are we locked in our own opinions? How often are we not even unwilling, we just don't bother to read the opinions of others in the paper or online or watch a news program that has a different point of view than ours? How often do we just take in lockstep with whatever political path we may be on and just accept this is the way that people who think what I think think and so that's what I'm going to think. But Jesus shows us a different way. Here, Jesus gives us permission, I think. Maybe even more than that. Jesus empowers us to really listen to another point of view. Not just with the ear, but also with the heart. With the possibility that just maybe, just maybe, we might change how we think, how we feel. And just what is it, do you think, that changed Jesus here? What do you think it is that made him change? I mean, the food first goes to the children, only later to the dogs. And yet here's this woman, face to face with Jesus, willing, as any of us would be, to do anything for her daughter. Anything. She'll even accept the label of a dog. Did you hear that? Even the dogs get the crumbs. And it's being face to face with this Syrophoenician woman that causes Jesus to change his heart and his mind and to send her home to find her daughter well. You know, every, every issue looks different when it wears a human face. Alcoholism, depression, unemployment, same-gender marriage, abortion. Every issue looks different when it wears a human face. You know, just this week, the Pope said that there's grace for women who have ended their pregnancies. I mean, if you know anything about grace, you know that's, that's been true long before, but the Pope said so in a way that, that indicated that he's, he knows that this issue isn't an issue. This is, this is people. This is women with faces. And it transformed him and by what I'm reading and hearing, millions of people who are responding to his seeing that as an issue of the face. It's fascinating, I think, that uh, this is the scripture that is appointed to be read today by the lectionary, a three-year cycle of texts. This is the gospel reading for today. Today, the Syrophoenician women who comes to Jesus at a time when men and women and children are fleeing that exact same part of the world for their own lives. And what an incredibly difficult issue if you're someone in authority, somebody you have to 
decide how are we going to handle not just a dozen, not just a thousand, but hundreds of thousands of refugees. How are we going to do that? And no wonder at times the response seems harsh. But as soon as those, that issue becomes a face, <coughs> or many, many faces, as is happening as we hear the stories of these people and what they are fleeing and the incredible risks they're willing to take, just so they can, just so they can live, it becomes a different thing altogether. I heard on the radio that many of these refugees had started to walk from Budapest to the Austrian border because they could not catch a train. Because no one official was doing anything to, to help. And as they walked along the way, the Hungarian people were coming out to greet them, to encourage them, to give them food, to give them clothing, to give them diapers. And these beautiful interactions between people, all because, all because this issue now had a face. Hundreds, thousands of faces of people walking by. And the Hungarian people's faces changed too, from what I was hearing. Just this last week in the Union Tribune, there was an interview with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency Commissioner. And he was asked uh, by the Union Tribune, do you have any evidence about, uh, you know, the, the one political candidate's assertion that, you know, Mexico just sends us their murderers and rapists? Do you have any evidence for or against this? And he said, you know, I haven't really even, he said, I'm sure there, that's out there, but I haven't even inquired about that because part of what I do is I go to places like McAllen, Texas, and I, Time after time, I've sat in rooms with people in the holding cells before they're deported back to Mexico. So then they want, you know, a better life for their children. They want a job. They want the things that we all want. I don't. I'm not afraid at all when I sit there with them. So he didn't directly answer the question, but he really did by giving giving the question a face. A problem is different when it wears a human face. An issue is different when it wears a face. If we think about the experiences we've had, whether it's with those things like employment or alcoholism or cancer, in our past, they're different when they wear a face. And one of the things that I'm grateful that Jesus showed us in the story that when something wears a human face, it's all right to change your mind. It's good to change your heart. Pray with me. Oh Lord, give us the eyes to see the faces that are on each and every issue for Christ's sake. For the world's sake and for our own sakes. Amen.